Taipei, Hong Kong, I'm sitting in, Charles here, and Jan sitting in Singapore, and we've got Flat sitting in Tokyo. So oh, that, wow. Thank you very much for your time, Audrey, talking to us today on many, many topics or sharing on some sort of the identity issues. Just perhaps you have read of the Canadian actress or actor, mm-hmm. Ellen Page and Elliot Page. Mm-hmm. We are so happy for someone who really like going going out mm-hmm. uh, to be the real himself or herself. Yeah, I'm, I'm, really I'm aware start, of the news, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, before we really kick start, mm-hmm. on the pole line, yeah, what would be the best in terms of in the Chinese community or even in the international communications, which pole line you would like us, you would suggest us to use, like, she or they or it doesn't matter at all. Yeah, my, my Twitter profile actually writes star slash star, uh, which is the kind of internet protocol for whatever. Um, and so you, you can't offend me, just literally whatever. <laughs> yeah, just order, lovely order. Mm-hmm. Since yeah. in the internet world, in Japan, you're really popular, even though across the Chinese community, including Epic Chinese in Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, or the internet community, internet generation. We do admire you, uh, even though the manga or the comic, the portrait in Japan, is it like a crazy sharing most of the time. So how you say it? Do you like it in terms of that kind of, of character? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I offer myself, including this recording, uh, I mean, uh, I usually publish under Creative Commons uh, for the video. All the recordings, including this one, uh, is going to be published under Creative Commons attribution. So long as the source is attributed, I'm happy uh, to get remixed. So, And I do get remixed. So there's a, a rap band in Japan called Dos Monos, just, just, just took one of those interviews and then made a rap song uh, about a kind of civics uh, and the civic sector, the social sector. I uh, enrolled in the interview not knowing at all that it would be made into a rap song, uh, but it happened yeah. anyway. So it is, uh, I guess, my pleasure uh, that I get to witness so many remixes, but it's just like the, you know, uh, the work is called Mona Lisa, but the uh, artist is certainly not Mona Lisa. Uh, so I'm more <laughs> like the, the title or the tagline of the work, but I do not identify as the author of the work, but I'm happy to be um, um, exposed to so many remixes. Yeah. yeah, it's been so nice seeing just like the Mona Lisa. I mean, yeah, at our work, we've been seeing the smile from uh-huh. every single angle, mm-hmm. 30 degrees of flawless smile from you or even in our sector. Yeah, so that's right. Like yes. Another, like, some quick icebreaker question. Uh-huh, what sure. is your favorite Japanese band since we got like Japanese representatives here? Mm-hmm. What's your favorite mm-hmm. music in Japan? Uh-huh. The band you uh-huh. mentioned? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, the favorite Japanese band. Uh, I, I guess I just mentioned those monos, <laughs> and uh, they, they, they uh, I think, are very experimental. And I saw the MV of the remix of the Civil Rap song, and these are generated uh, through AI, through uh, what we call a generated adversary network on the visual field. Um, and so I, I think this is pretty, pretty nice. Uh, and as for other cultural uh, products, I guess I, I grew up, um, you know, reading the manga about the Doraemon and still uh, nowadays that is actually my kind of dominant model to think about AI. It's assistive uh, intelligence to assist uh, the protagonist instead of uh, you know the Terminator which uh, fortunately I did not watch uh, as a child <laughs> which is a more authoritarian uh, intelligence. Yeah but I'm sure everyone at our generation we love Doraemon a lot even though in Singapore I'm sure Jen huh? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I even cosplayed Doraemon in one of the clips, like like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the superb. So, yeah, not much icebreaker here, but final one. Yeah, we did a little bit research. You mentioned that we've been doing twice puberty. That's so right. Mano, oh, how, how, how did it come through to your mind at that point? Sure. Um, So when I went through my first puberty around 13 uh, years old, um, I noticed that um, I don't quite develop like all the way. uh, And that has been kind of a mystery. I attribute it to my, um, I guess, the heart disease that's been with me since I was born uh, until the surgery at 12. So maybe I told myself I'm still recovering from the surgery. Uh, But later on, um, in my early tweens, uh, I will uh, get a test and the doctor is 
said to me that uh, my testosterone level is naturally very low, um, similar to uh, like a man of 80 years old or something. Uh, and that's even when I was just 20. Um, and so that means that the development, the hormonal development is somewhere between uh, the kind of normal, whatever that means, um, of the two uh, binary sexes. Uh, and so it got me interested in this whole hormonal business. Um, and so at the time, I also understood that there's the hormonal replacement therapy options going on. Um, and so I did some uh, research and started HRT, uh, which took place when I was 24, 25. Um, and the mm -hmm. second puberty, uh, I did not have to take um, a lot of uh, anti-testosterone, mostly just estrogen. Uh, and it did have an effect of the second development of the body. And again, it only went uh, for a couple years, I guess. Uh, but it really enabled my brain to, I guess, feel the body in a very different lens. Uh, and so that's the two puberties. <laughs> You're a biohacker. Uh -huh, uh -huh, I am. I am. Very much so. Yeah. yeah I'm so glad we are all staying in a pink choice era of the time. Mm -hmm. I'm so unprecedented 2020 and get to the second day of December. Getting mm -hmm. a new chance talking to you all the right here so that, that that's just it for the icebreaker and they pass it to Jen or, or Fred or we can really kick off. Okay. I think let's kick off with Fred. I think we sure. start. Sure, I get the chunky, 12 minutes. Yes, chunky part of the, uh, of, yeah. of the talk here. Um, can I ask, you lived in the East and the West both. You spent some time in California, is that mm -hmm. right? And I wonder about your views of how LGBTQ issues are in the East versus the West. Are there big differences? And if there are, do they? Um, how do they affect uh, the kind of approach we might want to take here for activism? Well, even in Taiwan, uh, which is a very transcultural republic of citizens, which is our official name of the state, by the way, um, and there is more than 20 uh, languages and therefore more than 20 cultures. Um, and on the east of Taiwan, which is mostly indigenous um, culture, we have the Amis, which is a matriarchy. Uh, we have, for example, the Paiwan, which uh, doesn't really care about gender stereotypes when choosing leaders and so on. Uh, and of course, we have the Western part of Taiwan, which is more Western. Um, and so I guess the, the even within Taiwan itself, we have different um, stereotypes. So when somebody says that, you know, acting like a boy or like a girl, that uh, totally depends on which of the 20 national languages that you're saying these uh, words to. And so I guess that uh, shows the diversity and the need of inclusiveness um, as part of Taiwanese democratization. Uh, so, uh, but with that said, I think around our corner of earth. Um, the main issue uh, when we talk about LGBTIQA plus rights um, is a, a generational perspective. Uh, for example, when we legalized marriage equality, the main uh, dividing point in the society was that people who were married before 2007, many of them still think marriage is something between families. And uh, uh, people, uh, the two individuals, merely act as representatives of the two families. So it's the families that wed. And we have special uh, terms uh, to refer, like there's literally eight different terms for uh, uncles and aunts. Um, and that reflects the family to family relationship. And many of them uh, are legitimately worried that uh, the marriage equality law will hijack this um, social definition of marriage as between two families. On the other hand, people who married after 2008, when we switched to a uh, exclusively marriage by registration system, understood this more as uh, rights and duties be between two individuals, and their families may or may not know each other. And this is actually quite a new uh, perspective on marriage. Before, it was the two families, as long as they throw out a, a you know, large banquet and so on, um, then uh, the marriage is done. And whether they register it after the fact, that's quite beside the point. This is like uh, when a child is born, the child is born. Whether you register the birth certificate um, is quite beside the point. Uh, but after 2008, it uh, just happens only on the day of registration. So this is why uh, when we legalize marriage equality, we have to innovate socially on how to make those two uh, different views on marriage uh, work with each other. And we don't have a lot of uh, so-called Western, that's to say uh, American, European, examples to follow. And at the end, uh, we legalize the uh, bylaws, but not the in-laws, 
we made a act mm. for uh, marriage equality, which hyperlinks to all parts in the law that talks about individual to individual relationships uh, by law, but it does not hyperlink to the family to family part. So there's no in-law relationship. And so this social innovation managed to convince people of uh, all different generations that this is something worth having, protecting um, the rights and duties of individuals, but we don't have to invent another eight words for aunts and uncles and things like that. And that uh, I think is a genuine social innovation that we do not see in other coaches. So can you unpack that a little bit for, I mean, one of the things that we'd like to do is show this to our colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, some of them um, have, have no, no real knowledge or understanding mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of what some of the systems are in Asia. And even I, I mean, I know Japan best, mm -hmm. which has a very strong family system mm -hmm. uh, and family registration. And, and what mm -hmm. you're describing sounds similar, but a little different. Yeah, so it, it, if you similar. could explain yes. a little bit um, for people who know nothing mm -hmm. about this, that mm -hmm. would be helpful. Sure. So um, actually a lot like Japan, because Taiwan was under Japanese colonial rule uh, for a long right. time uh, before the World War II, right? So um, a lot of the customs uh, are part of the Japanese culture. Uh, for example, uh, the family having a family name and for uh, women after wedding to kind of give up uh, her maiden family name and things like that. On the other hand, I think the feminist movement uh, in Taiwan really um, gained a lot more ground uh, than their counterparts. Um, in other jurisdictions um, in East Asia, so that uh, quite a while ago, like more than 12 years ago, we already have gender mainstreaming uh, as part of the gender equality committee in our public service, so that all the ministerial uh, work, uh, it could be draft bills, it could be uh, budget items, any project that extends to more than one year long, have to go through what we call a uh, gender impact assessment or the GIA. And the GIA is done primarily primarily through this equality committee that has uh, 17 civil society organizers and 16 ministers. Uh, so the CSOs always have one more vote <laughs> than the ministers, uh, and they very systemically um, get the ideas of gender equality through, and each and every measure and budget need to measure its actual impact, not only on, for example, the um, ratio of women in parliament, which is now over 40% now, if you keep measuring it, and doesn't accept any uh, like rolling back, uh, but also all the different levels in the society, all the different sectors, long after the like four year project is gone, uh, the GIA assessment in the gender dashboard, they just keep measuring it. So that's why we have a, I would say, <clears throat> evidence based uh, platform that we can then evaluate each and every uh, project to make sure that the government public service understand how to measure the gender equality impact. So it become kind of ingrained in the public service. So I think that is uh, one of the details that lead to the kind of social innovation of legalizing the bylaws but not the in-laws. And this is almost uh, all due to the public service readily understanding the gender impact for each and every um, budget items and each and every legislation. So that when the two referenda and uh, one constitutional rule ruling came, um, the public service reacted very quickly and was able to find this solution, a very confined solution space. So when you say legalized bylaws, one, one more time, what, what that mm -hmm. is? Yeah, it means that when two um, homosexual uh, individuals wed, uh, they enjoy exactly the same rights and duties as heterosexual couples, except their families do not form kinship uh, relationships. Um, and so, in a sense, it is essentially a state-sponsored arrangement between the two people and which in Mandarin we call jie hun, uh, like the, the marriage part, the wedding part, but it's not jie yin, it's not the kinship part. So huh. jie hun bu jie yin, marrying the um, bylaws but not the in-laws uh, is kind of the moniker for this arrangement. I see, okay. So the, the um, it's it's legal, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it, it keeps you out of the social mess mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you might have. That's right, then. exactly. Okay. Yes. Um, any other reasons or any other things that, uh, that you think of that um, let Taiwan advance farther than many other countries in the region uh, in LGBTQ 
uh, rights so far. Because uh, so far, Taiwan, I think, is still the only country in the region mm -hmm. where um, marriage equality is uh, has has passed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in addition, you mean to the uh, public service innovations and to the um, Gender Equality Committee, which is a direct um, result of the feminist movement uh, earlier on. And uh, one of the prominent uh, feminist leaders, uh, Annette Lu, uh, was also our vice president. Um, and now, of course, with Dr. Tsai Ing-wen as our president, we can say, um, you, you know, even if it's just 42% women in the parliament, there's 100% in the president uh, office, I guess. Uh, and so uh, all these are, are great um, beginnings uh, for the LGBTIQA plus movement to not only model itself on the earlier wave feminist movement, but also learn from the feminist uh, movement activists who didn't rest on their laurels, but uh, just started then working uh, in, through intersectionality and so on on the later part of the movement. So this intergenerational solidarity, even within the social sector itself, I think plays a large part. What else do you think needs to happen mm -hmm. in Taiwan mm -hmm. now? So I, I think... Um, it, well, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. what, what else What else needs to happen in order for full mm -hmm. equality? Sure. Um, so many people who hold a like permanent residence certificate uh, or a gold card, which is getting very popular uh, because of this year, because of Taiwan, right? Uh, because of COVID, I mean, uh, people can actually still uh, migrate to Taiwan if they apply for uh, something at TaiwanGoldCard.com. Uh, you can learn that, which we learned from Singapore, by the way. So thank you, Singapore. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, the point is that um, for many people, um, they quickly learn that as a resident, um, it's a sort of inequality just by the national ID number, because the uh, foreign people, even if they have a permanent residency, um, have a different formatted uh, resident number compared to the national ID, which is for citizens. So one can very easily, even in online um, registration, like buying train tickets or movie tickets and so on, uh, gets mistakenly uh, rejected by the system simply because their residential um, numbers doesn't look like a national ID number. And that's what we're going to fix in the next quarter or so uh, by issuing essentially a new number that is numeric on the second digit instead of a uh, letter um, for um, people who were holding residential um, cert certificates. And, and sorry. Just, sorry, let me finish. So, uh -huh. so um, and we understand that um, our second digit is currently binary. Um, it is one. Uh, uh, for male and, and two for female. Uh, and similarly, we're going to hand out uh, like eight and nine uh, for the binary sexes. Uh, but the difference now, of course, is that some of the uh, foreign people who become residents uh, were in their passport uh, non-binary, like if they come from Australia and so on. So we probably have to invent a new digit, maybe seven, uh, for the non-binary foreign people <laughs> to get a national ID-like um, numbering. Uh, and that will then necessitate uh, the change in our um, household registration system, all the different systems to allow for non-binary genders as we did for the quarantine um, system when people uh, apply for quarantine when they uh, visit Taiwan. And that will then probably lead the way uh, to the uh, zero, which is the digit that we're brainstorming that will then apply to also citizens uh, who identify as non-binary. And I'll probably change my ID number then. Huh. So, so that sounds like it will. The change will start with the non with the non Taiwanese residents. Mm -hmm. That's right. The non Taiwanese non-binary. And it will sort of seep through into yes. in, into mm -hmm. uh, into Taiwanese. That's right. Registry. Mm -hmm. When you say the 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 household registration will be affected as well, mm -hmm. does that bring up the problems that you uh, mentioned before about? Um, you know about families mm -hmm. versus you know legality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. There, there's uh, two parts of this, right? Uh, the first part is the part about code, uh, and it's not legal code. It's just you know computer code in, yeah. in all the registration system, like the quarantine system. We have to provide a non-binary as a choice. Otherwise, no matter what the law says, the, the computer will not uh, admit it. So that part needs to change. And then, of course, there are also parts uh, where the um, two different genders were enjoying. Uh, 
uh, different responsibilities and different um, like for example um, like right until now um, people can apply for a wedding for a heterosexual wedding uh, if they are uh, 18 years old however women can apply for it when they're 16 years old However, mm -hmm. if there's two women who want to marry as a homosexual couple, then both must be 18 years old. It makes no sense. <laughs> it, it doesn't make any sense to me either. Uh, it only made sense, I guess, because a 16-year-old girl may act as a representative of her family in a family-to-family -family, uh, marriage, right? But uh, if you throw non-binary into the mix, into the mix, it, it doesn't work. Um, it, it it doesn't work uh, before, but it wouldn't even work uh, if you think about the, the underlying reasons. So nowadays, uh, we do have a law amendment currently in the parliament awaiting deliberation uh, and hopefully to be passed soon. That would just uh, say 18 years old for. All, all people involved, regardless of their gender. Unless that happens, of course, non-binaries, if you add it to the mix, it will create even more confusion. <laughs> so this is a segue to my next question, which is, um, you, you do, you're a, you're a digital hacktivist, mm -hmm. um, and you have a lot of innovative um, solutions for uh, trying to, to rally consensus and uh, direct policy mm -hmm. uh, that's informed by your, um, your mm -hmm. digital activist views. Mm -hmm. Is there an intersection between that um, and uh, the LGBTQ mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, changes mm -hmm. and activism mm -hmm. that you're trying to, to bring it about? Is there something that um, you learn from your uh, work with, with the digital <laughs> activism mm -hmm. part that's applicable to um uh, LGBTQ mm -hmm. issues as well. Sure. Uh, so yeah, when I uh, underwent my second puberty, I wrote a blog post explaining it to my fellow um, computer scientists and hacktivists, and I used the term runtime typecasting, uh, which is a a term that <laughs> what's, will what's that? it will make sense <laughs> to to a computer programmer, right? Um, because uh, like runtime is uh, by nurture and compile time, that is to say before the program run, but after you write the program down, is like um, by nature. Uh, that's the, the DNA expression part. And typecasting uh, simply means that uh, I interface with the world from a different, uh, different way, a different type. Um, and so these two words taken together uh, means that um, it's mostly about um, kind of what Judith Butler referred to as uh, gender performance. Like this is a, a new performance, a, a new um, interface that I'm developing uh, in runtime, that is to say after I'm born. Uh, and this very neatly that decouples the, the gender part from the sex part, which is kind of difficult actually. If you know Japanese kanji, um, you will uh, you will understand that for the gender and sex, uh, still they use probably the same word uh, for it. Yeah. Um, and that word, however, have two parts: the uh, runtime part and the compile time part. Um, the kanji itself is composed of two components, and the component stands uh, for the for the mind and for the biology. Uh, and mm. so the biology part is by nature and the mind part is by nurture. And just mm. by uh, using computer uh, language uh, metaphors, I was able then to kind of express those concepts much more clearly. <laughs> For your computer friends. Yes, but it also applies to, to everyday life. Like when mm. I just explained it, like the two components of the kanji. If you know that mm -hmm. kanji, that would also make sense mm -hmm. to you. I see, I see. <clears throat> um, it, I guess we're we're heading into the final minutes here. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we all three of us we work at a big media organization, mm -hmm. and we think about um, our roles as people who you know work there mm -hmm. and what we can and should be doing um, as LGBTQ mm -hmm. uh, people and allies. Mm -hmm. What do you think, um, you know, media mm -hmm. people? should be doing. Um, we're, you know, we're also in a big multinational company. Mm -hmm. Do we have particular responsibilities or do you have a wish list mm -hmm. of, uh, for people who are in our mm -hmm. situation? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah.、Uh, so back when、um, I think in April,、uh, in our daily Central Epidemic Command Center live、uh, press conference,、um, there was a day I think around mid-April、uh, where a young boy or his family、um, called to the hotline one nine two two to say basically complain that we were rationing out mask. All they get was pink medical mask, and the young boy doesn't want to wear it to school.、Uh, and the very next day, the in the live stream. Press conference. All the medical officers, regardless of gender, wore pink medical masks. And the、uh, commander, Minister Chen Shizhong, even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero.、Uh, and so the the boy became the most hit boy, right? So for only he in the class has the、uh, color that the heroes wear, but also the color that heroes hero wear.、Uh, I guess、uh, mm-hmm. is. But anyway,、uh, so and that、uh, prompted a lot of actions from the largest、uh, companies, and especially in media,、uh, they. Just changed their avatars on social media. Pink.、Uh, for a while, pink was the 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 most trendy color、um, in, in the entire town, and everybody become a little bit more transgender because of it. <clears throat> and I think this is great. And then, <clears throat> of course, came the the two、uh, pride parades: one in Taipei and one in Gaoshan. And now the rainbow is the most fashionable mask. And so there is a lot of things one can do、uh, to get what I just referred to、uh, as gender performance as something that's that's hip. That that's cool. That's、uh, entirely fine for people to be a little bit more transgender, and I think that is the message I want to send. Hmm. Gender performance.、Mm-hmm. Um. Do you have a a particular? Um. Do you have a particular favorite of your own gender performance? Other、mm-hmm. other examples that you、mm-hmm. that you can give since you're a role model for that、mm-hmm. for us.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. So,、uh, or for example, when I、uh, usually sign off my conversations、uh, with international counterparts this year,、uh, saying "live long and prosper." So, so that's not particularly transgender. It's maybe transspecies,、uh, except of course this Star Trek is not a actual alien species, but but it does、uh, kind of convey this sort of performance. Like、um, I identify with you,、uh, not because you happen to be in some ethnicity and so on, but because、uh, we both identify as I guess Homo sapiens. And it takes a Vulcan salute to to say that. <laughs> Right, so so this is、uh, a little bit、um, performative, but it also reminds us that uh, as uh, especially non-binary people, we don't have it in our mind that half of the population is somehow different from me. Uh, we we like each other and we enjoy each other's companies without、uh, sorting each other into binary categories, and that is applicable not only on the gender lens but also a cultural lens and also a species lens, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> So you know you're a cabinet minister,、mm-hmm. and、um, you deal with all kinds of people at all levels, corporate,、sure. government, etc.、Mm-hmm. When you're when you are doing your gender performative mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm.、Um, or just as you're you know just as you,、mm-hmm. uh, do、yes. you not?、Mm-hmm. Um, Encounter resistance or shock or or、mm-hmm. uh, from you know I I imagine、mm-hmm. just from dealing with、mm-hmm. people in Japan、mm-hmm. that a lot of people in government and business are pretty conservative.、Mm-hmm. So how do you、mm-hmm. do you not encounter resistance and how do you deal with it? What resistance? We are the resistance.、Uh- <laughs> 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 yeah, but but that's that's actually true. We we are the resistance、uh, in many senses.、Uh, I think、uh, the society、uh, really welcomes diversity and inclusion when I very empathetically、um, take all the sides. That that's my whole message. This is what this rainbow represents to me, which has a really nice gradient, by the way. So this is not、mm-hmm. like strictly、um, categorized,、uh, and so like a real rainbow, right? <laughs> and so in a sense,、um, the the border between the colors is a little bit blurred, and it shows the capacity of the human mind to simultaneously take all the sides. Which、uh, is a good message,、uh, not just around gender, but transculturalism and、uh, intergenerational solidarity and things like that. And that's my core message: that people with different positions and life experience, nevertheless, share common values. And it's my job as a politician、uh, to somehow,、um, you know, resonate with people so that we find our common values. And that is, I think, a message that people broadly agree on. Mm. And you've been successful in yeah, doing that,、definitely. even with even across business, across、mm-hmm. politics. Yeah, certainly. Generational. Certainly. 
I mean, who would be against sustainability, right? That's something that's evolved uh, long ago away. If if people, uh, there are strains of civilization that are against sustainability, they probably have erased themselves uh, long before. <laughs> Okay. Well, it looks like it's time. Mm -hmm. it um, is. Mm -hmm. But it, it's been a lot of fun talking. Yeah, indeed. So, I'm, given that we are a little bit over on sure. one final like, sure. question or sharing, perhaps Audrey could help. I've been watching, reading the news about the military or uh, the things that's ready. It's like, I'm sure it's the very, very first one in the oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I cannot imagine in the mm -hmm. Korean army, Japanese army, the mm -hmm. self defense group troops. Singapore armies, that, that could happen. It's mm -hmm. been like a tremendous remark regarding mm -hmm. the equality fighting. But have you been engaged in any role in the military or equality fighting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and I mean, back in just 10 years ago, it would be unimaginable for Taiwanese people too. So I guess what it takes really is good examples and a good uh, conversation even for people in different generations or different positions, manage to find the kind of innovation. I'm not saying that you should carbon copy this marrying individuals but not families, but it's a beginning, it's a starting point to get people thinking about not left wing, not right wing, but up wing, right? Uh, not uh, falling to this side but, or that side, but grow, grow up. Um, and I think this is um, something that you can apply to pretty much everywhere. Whenever you, like Lena Cohen who said, um, wherever you, you see a crack, right? There's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. And, and that's where we should focus our energy. Thank you. Uh, Very good. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Yeah, so, so we all do this. Yes, contact. yes, that's right. Yes. So, yeah, I did my practice. <laughs> live, live long and prosper. <laughs> live long and prosper. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much, Audrey. Okay.